Archaic Records. Not too bad for my first time. There could be some improvements made and I cannot touch my face for the whole night, but here we go. Hey, what's up everybody? It's Archaic Records here with you again. My name is Jamie, coming at you from Nashville, Tennessee. And I just got back Monday night from the KISS End of the Row Tour as they made their stop here in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, now I think I've told you on this channel, I consider myself to be slightly more than a casual KISS fan. Uh, I definitely wouldn't uh, classify myself as being a diehard or hardcore by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, but I sort of exist in that kind of gray area uh, in between being a casual fan and being a diehard fan. I am a really uh, big fan of the band's original era, uh, going back to probably the solo or the self-titled 1974 album, uh, probably up through Creatures of the Night. Uh, I think I own all of those records on vinyl, and I've uh, been a fan of that band, of those records, really for a very long time. My personal relationship uh, with KISS really goes back, uh, as far as I can remember, really. Uh, I don't really remember a time in my life when I didn't know who KISS was. I don't remember the exact moment in time that I first saw the name or heard the name KISS. Uh, when I was a little kid or when I was a kid, my parents, uh, I was sort of relatively lucky in the fact that both my parents uh, had relatively good taste in music. They had very different taste in music from each other, but they both had I would say relatively good taste in music as far as parents go. And I remember uh, that my mom uh, did have a couple of KISS cassettes. Uh, I believe she had uh, Destroyer and Love Gun. Now, my parents always kept their cassettes uh, sort of in our living room uh, near where our stereo was. Now, I would never uh, dare, uh, you know, touch and use my parents' stereo because if I were caught in the act doing that... <laughs> It would not be a pretty sight, but I do remember I used to like to sort of thumb through my parents' cassettes and see the music they had. Uh, and I do remember that my mom had uh, two uh, Kiss cassettes, and I remember uh, just looking at the artwork on the covers of them and being just completely uh, mesmerized by the artwork uh, on Destroyer uh, and Love Gun. I was like, man, who are these guys? These guys are scary. Uh, I also, around the same time, I had an, a cousin who was several years older than me, uh, and he was really into like heavy metal. I remember his band, his favorite band, uh, his go-to band was Judas Priest, and I remember if you ever walk, went into his bedroom, uh, the whole place was just wallpapered uh, with all sort of heavy metal imagery, uh, and I do remember uh, he had several uh, Kiss posters, Kiss you know pinups, and I remember looking at those guys, and I was like, Man, they're scary. Uh, before I even really heard them or knew what they sounded like, I had built this uh, sort of uh, audio uh, idea in my mind of what these guys must have sounded like, and they must have just been the scariest thing uh, in the entire world. In fact, I remember uh, the first time uh, listening to Kiss uh, and actually knowing who they were and hearing it, I remember it was probably the song I was made for Loving You. I think that might have been the first Kiss song I actually remember hearing, uh, or seeing a video for at least. And I remember being sort of confused the first time I heard it because I had built up this image in my mind uh, of what the band sounded like, and it sounded completely different than I expected. Uh, very benign, very poppy. Uh, I was kind of surprised. I would say I didn't really start listening to Kiss until probably around 1999 or 2000. Uh, I moved to Seattle in 1999 from the Bay Area, and I began working uh, with a guy who I became very close friends with. Uh, he and I were very much sort of musical kindred spirits. Uh, he and I liked a lot of the same bands. We liked a lot of the same records. Uh, he and I used to hang out all the time, go to shows. Uh, we'd go over to his house and listen uh, to records, and one day I was over at his house uh, doing that. We were going to listen to some records, probably uh, drain a six-pack. And I remember he uh, was sort of thumbing through his vinyl. He's like, oh, man, what do you want to hear? He's like, I just really, I, and he stopped. He's like, oh, I want to hear Kiss. Which record do you want to listen to? Uh, and at the time, I thought I just hated Kiss. I came from more of like a punk rock 
kind of fan background. Uh, I sat there and I was like, no, I don't want to listen to Kiss. They suck, man. And as my friend was thumbing through his records, he stopped dead in his tracks. Uh, he looked over at me. He's like, no, no, you cannot say that. Uh, I'm not going to allow you to say that. So he put on uh, a Kiss record. I don't remember which one it was specifically. Uh, but I remember sitting there uh, very stubbornly uh, unhappy about the situation with my arms folded. Uh, just like, like, you know, giving him the scowl of death. Uh, but within the, the course of a few songs, I felt my head starting to kind of nod uh, along. And I remember thinking, oh, maybe this isn't the worst thing I've ever heard in my entire life. And uh, from that point on, I slowly began uh, to develop more of an appreciation for the band. Uh, and like I said, to this, uh, up to this point in time, I would say I'm slightly more than a casual fan, at least of the band's original era. Now, after Creatures of the Night... Uh, I think the band has got a lot of good stuff in their catalog after that. Uh, they've got a lot of clunkage in their catalog after that. Uh, but really, I would say that I stake my fandom in that original era. Uh, the original kind of makeup era uh, is the stuff that I'm really drawn to. And I really like a lot. Now, I said this before on the uh, video I did talking about the Kiss solo, or the Kiss, I keep saying solo, the Kiss debut album from 1974. Uh, and I don't say this just to suck ass, uh, but really where my relationship with the band is at its strongest uh, is with KISS fans. I've just always really had uh, a real love and affection for KISS fans. I just completely admire uh, their passion, their fire, their dedication, uh, the fact uh, that they remain loyal to this band through all sorts of lineup changes and all sorts of uh, controversy. Uh, I just really, as somebody uh, myself uh, who is relatively obsessed with his favorite recording artist, uh, it's something that I can really relate to. Uh, I think that KISS fans uh, have always been very friendly, very welcoming. I love the fact uh, that the KISS uh, thing, the KISS fandom world is a big community. Uh, sometimes I think I've said this on this channel as well, sometimes I wish being a Morrissey fan Sometimes I wish that there was more of a community uh, within us. Now, KISS fans uh, and Morrissey fans are very different from each other. Uh, I think KISS fans are more of a community-based uh, tribe, whereas uh, Morrissey fans, I think we tend to be <laughs> sort of miserable loners. Uh, not saying that I don't uh, fit that description. I sort of do. But I do I am envious sometimes of the fact that you know, there really is like this sort of KISS community. Uh, I think that the term KISS Army uh, can actually be taken quite literally. Uh, I think I've told you also, uh, I'm just a huge fan of watching some of the KISS content uh, here on YouTube and my all-time favorite uh, podcast uh, that I listen to. I'm not the hugest podcast guy in the world, but my favorite podcast, one that I listen to uh, the most religiously, is a KISS a podcast called Three Sides of the Coin. I love those guys. Uh, I love the fact that depending on which week it is, uh, how many of them show up for the show, it's either three or four or friends. And basically they just sit around and dweeb out on their uh, KISS fandom. Uh, so uh, I really uh, have a huge amount of respect and love for KISS fans. Now, this tour... Uh, this end of the road tour. I'm not sure exactly when it began, uh, but I know I have sort of been keeping my eyes on it uh, just based on the fact that they are one of the most iconic uh, brands, bands or brands, how we describe it in uh, rock and roll. Like I said, I am a casual fan. Uh, and when the tickets of the show was announced here in Nashville, uh, for me, it was a no brainer. Uh, my wife has never seen Kiss. Uh, and when the tickets went on sale here, I think we snatched them up. Ours, pretty much the day they went on sale, this was something that you don't even really have to think twice about. Uh, especially, like I said, my wife uh, has never seen them. Uh, and this is one of the most uh, iconic bands in the history of rock and roll, whether you're a fan or not. I feel like you have to go see uh, Kiss if you have the opportunity uh, at least once. I was a little bit surprised, to be honest with you. We bought these tickets... 
uh, like I said, pretty much when they first went on sale out here in Nashville. And my wife uh, was surprisingly, to me, excited about this show. She was really cranked to go see Kiss. Uh, the reason why I was surprised isn't that she doesn't love music. She does. Uh, but really, it's just not her style of music at all. Uh, she tends to be into a lot of other different kinds of music. Uh, but as the Kiss show was approaching, uh, she just became more and more excited. And actually, uh, the night of the show, she did the makeup. She did everything else. We actually filmed a pregame show uh, for this channel. And we didn't like how it turned out, so it ended up getting scrapped. But we did film a pregame show of her uh, applying her makeup. She went as Ace. Uh, so I will include uh, some video at least of her makeup. She was very proud of it on this video, uh, either before me blabbing or after. Uh, but anyway, uh, the day the show came, young yeah, Monday, and my wife and I uh, headed downtown Nashville to the Broadway area. The show was at the Bridgestone Arena which is the hockey arena down here in Nashville. Hockey, Nashville does have a hockey team. Uh, and I was quite surprised, actually, when my wife and I first moved to Nashville uh, to find out what a big deal the hockey team here is. I uh, sort of was not expecting that. I don't know why. Maybe it's the southern thing. Uh, I don't know, but we don't... Um, we have been to a couple games. It's fun, but it is a big thing down here. I'm surprised. Uh, now, my wife and I have lived in Nashville for about three and a half years, uh, and I guess this makes us sort of typical uh, Nashvillians, but we really don't go down to Broadway that often, uh, maybe two, three, four times a year tops. Uh, usually it's if we're going to another event uh, at the Ryman Auditorium or at Bridgestone Arena that we end up uh, going down to Broadway. Now, I don't have anything against Broadway. I actually kind of like it down there. A lot of uh, natives and longtime locals here, they really hate on Broadway uh, for what it is. Uh, basically, it's just a giant, huge, uh, drunken party, uh, which doesn't bother me, doesn't offend me. I am all for people having a good time. Uh, sometimes I think, you know, people become the fun police, uh, especially as they get older. Uh, I don't seek out Broadway necessarily, but I, I like it when I'm down there. I usually have a good time. Uh, it is funny, though, to me that people... Uh, you know, come from all over the world uh, to Nashville to hang out on Broadway. Uh, because Nashville, to me, uh, it is Music City in a lot of ways. And there is a lot of really great music down here in Nashville. Uh, but I wouldn't say that Broadway is necessarily the epicenter of great music. Uh, a lot of the music on Broadway uh, reminds me of the movie, uh, the scene in the movie Ghost World, uh, where Enid and Seymour go to the sports bar because Seymour wants to see this old uh, blues singer perform. Uh, and the band that performs after the old blues singer uh, is a band called Blues Hammer. And that's kind of like what the music uh, on Broadway reminds me of is that scene in Ghost World. Uh, not necessarily the greatest music going on down there, especially in Nashville, where there you can really find some tremendous music all around the city. Uh, but Broadway is just a big party. It's a great time. I think that's more the appeal. Hopefully that's more the appeal uh, to people than the music that goes on down there. Uh, but anyway, we got down to Bridgestone Arena. Uh, the place is has this big gated off sort of outdoor courtyard. People were beginning uh, to gather, it was just such a beautiful night. Fall down here in Tennessee is absolutely amazing. Yeah, I'm talking about the weather. Uh, but especially after summer breaks, uh, which I like the summer down here, but it can be a little bit much for some people. But the fall down here is just incredible. It was a beautiful, perfect night out. Uh, they had uh, the sort of gated off area around Bridgestone Arena. Outside, they had this big courtyard. It's quite nice, actually. Uh, so we got down there, uh, discovered the uh, merch tent, uh, and there was a beer truck. My wife and I stopped over to grab ourselves a wobbly pop. Uh, and I uh, have to tell you that I was a little bit appalled. Uh, this has nothing to do with the band. This has to do with Bridgestone Arena, but beers were $19 each. 
Now, I remember when I used to think that $10 beers were completely asinine. Now, I guess in some sort of fairness or defense to Bridgestone Arena, they were the big 24 ounces. They weren't like little you know, party cups. But $19 for a beer. I, re- I read recently uh, that the hockey team here in Nashville, the Nashville Predators, hockey season just started, I guess. Uh, I'm not really the hugest uh, hockey guy in the world. I like it. It's not something that I am overly... I used to kind of be more into it than I am now. But I was reading recently that the... Uh, Predators, the National Hockey League team here in Nashville, have really struggled with attendance uh, here at the start of this uh, current season. Uh, And honestly, uh, I can't imagine why. Uh, Between tickets, uh, $30 to park, $19 for a beer, $15 for a little, like, sad-looking, stale, soft pretzel. I mean, for a family... Uh, four or five people going out to a hockey game, you've got to drop easily uh, five bills. Uh, I realize saying that, having said that, that I have completely morphed into my grandmother, which makes me not very happy uh, to know that Wanda is in here somewhere. Now, I know none of you know my grandmother, uh, but let me assure you that she's nothing nice. Uh, And I'm convinced, completely convinced, that the only reason why she's still alive is because death is scared of her uh anyway with our 19 dollars liquid gold in our hands uh, we made our way over to the merch tent uh, which i thought was really cool they had a merch tent outside Uh, they also had a big merch booth on the uh, inside of the arena too but i thought it was cool Uh, you could kind of like are you just waiting to get in you could get your merch if you wanted to Uh, my wife and i uh, each picked out a shirt and then got in line to go inside Uh, We got in, uh, we went in, and we sort of found our seats, and uh, one of the first things I noticed as I walked into the arena itself uh, was right over the middle of the floor, over where the seating area was, there were seats on the floor, which again, I've said this before, I don't really love. I think I like it when seats or when the floors are standing room, that's just my personal preference. Obviously, uh, maybe you're dealing with a slightly older crowd when you go to a KISS show. Although I will say uh, that the crowd ran the the gamut of ages. I was really impressed how many younger people in their 20s uh, were there. I thought that was actually really cool. Of course, you got the old OGs. That was pretty cool. I thought the, uh, the range, the age range for the show was actually really cool. But you walk in, and the first thing I noticed was this very low-hanging... A lighting rig over the middle of the floor area and I just was curious as to how that was going to work I feel like if you were sitting uh, anywhere in the seats kind of in the second and third level uh, that lighting rig just completely obstructed the view of the stage I've seen some footage that people shot on their phones from both Nashville and Cincinnati which is, I believe, where they were before they came here. Uh, And if you were sitting behind that lighting rig, uh, the stage was completely obstructed. Uh, Now, for a band that have been doing this for 50 years, uh, and a band that I would say are complete professionals, uh, I thought that that was a very uh, glaring uh, design flaw. I really hated that low-hanging light rig. Uh, I feel really bad for the people who couldn't see anything behind it. I'm sure... You were pretty much forced. They had screens on either side of the stage. I mean, at that point in time, you were probably sitting there watching the screens the entire night because the stage was obstructed. I thought that was really weak. Uh, Again, these guys are professionals. Uh, I know that they don't design the stage setup, but I thought that that was really, a really glaring and bad design flaw for the show. Uh, Apart from that, I thought the stage looked cool. Uh, When you walk in, it's a big-time rock show. I thought, you know, it looked cool. Uh, Obviously, you walk in, 
Uh, they have the four statues of the four characters on the side of the stage. The stage looked cool. And there's just something about walking in and seeing the KISS logo. You're almost just like starstruck by that. Uh, I thought the stage looked cool. Now, I haven't been to a big sort of arena uh, rock show in quite a while. I think the last one I went to uh, was... It was definitely pre-COVID. I think it was 2018 or 19. My wife and I went to uh, see Def Leppard in uh, Milwaukee at Summerfest, uh, which was a great show too. Now I am not a Def Leppard fan at all. I'm a much, uh, much bigger Kiss fan than I am a Def Leppard fan. But it was just a really fun show. Actually, I have to say I was shocked how many songs of Def Leppards I knew. I know they just ran through and did like a greatest hits festival set list but i recognized every song i mean that band must have a thousand hits because i knew them all and i'm not a fan but i thought the stage looked cool uh, we went over found our seats kind of got uh, nestled in if you will uh, now the band hadn't announced or hadn't seen any announcement of any sort of an opening band i didn't see anything uh, on the website for the band or for bridgestone arena i didn't see Anything on any sort of marquee. I don't remember seeing any merch for any sort of opening band, uh, at least before the show. And as we were sitting uh, around the people we were sitting, I was asking, or we were asking, is there an opener? Do you know what's going on? Because I always do this thing when I go to a show where I try uh, to avoid uh, seeing too much online set lists and live videos and stuff. I try to avoid it until after the show's over. The people sitting next to us uh, hadn't heard of any opening band either. Uh, but at a certain point, the lights went down and a band came out. An opening band that was called Amber Wild. Uh, let me try to think of the best thing I can say about Amber Wild to try to avoid uh, too much negativity. I think the nicest thing I could say about Amber Wild that they were terrible. <laughs> uh, I was actually uh, quite surprised. Now, I don't know uh, if you've ever seen a band that was so bad uh, that they made your teeth hurt. And I've been to a lot of shows in my life. I've been to a lot of shows in my life. I've seen a lot of questionable bands. Uh, and I've seen a lot of shitty bands. Uh, and I would say that this band, Amber Wilde, are pretty high... Uh, on the list, uh, I didn't find out until during the set that the singer of the band Amber Wild was none other than Evan Stanley, the son of Paul Stanley. Uh, when the guy sitting next to me uh, told us that, I was like, oh, okay, now I get it. <laughs> That's how this band ended up on this tour. Now, I would like to imagine that the negotiations for putting Amber Wilde on this tour, uh, this leg of the tour with Kiss, uh, was Evan Stanley walking around his multi-million dollar mansion uh, saying, Daddy, I want to open for Kiss, Daddy. And Paul Stanley uh, giving in uh, because uh, his spoiled Hollywood son probably gets everything he wants. Uh, anyway, oh my God, this band was rough um there was one scene or there was one scene there was one part of the show uh, where evan stanley who by the way basically does nothing but mimic uh, everything that his dad has already made famous uh, he sort of has uh, now it may not be deliberate obviously we can't help the voices we're born with otherwise i wouldn't have this voice uh, but when he sings it at least sounds like he's attempting uh, desperately to sound like his old man. Uh, and not only that, but he also does the sort of in-between song Paul Stanley banter, uh, which is sort of Paul Stanley's signature. Now, as a casual uh, sort of Kiss fan, I actually find Paul Stanley's uh, in-between song banter to be slightly uh, a bit much sometimes. Uh, but to watch this kid and i say kid he's probably 29 30 i think he's i think i looked it up i think he's 30 years old 29 years old 
basically uh, trying to pantomime and act like his dad was a little bit rough. Uh, I have read and seen some things since Monday of people defending uh, the band Amber Wild. Uh, now I get it if you're a Kiss fan. I get Kiss fans are loyal, dedicated. We've talked about that. But oh my God. Uh, there was one part in the show when uh, Evan Stanley uh, said, I'd like to thank my dad and Gene for having us up here. And I literally felt my skin crawl when he said that. It was just like, dude, barf o -rama. Now, nepotism uh, by anybody in a position of sort of power is pretty gross. But there's something particularly rancid about Hollywood nepotism that just makes me uh, just like really want to puke. Uh, there was a part towards the very end of Amber Wilde's set where Evan Stanley uh, talked about how they did have merch. Apparently they had shirts. Uh, by the way, I looked it up online because uh, he announced uh, during the show that the band had just dropped two singles uh, on Spotify. That's all they have is two songs uh, and this band are out opening arena shows for one of the most iconic uh, bands in the history of rock and roll. Just rough, man. Just rough. But there was a, a moment towards the very end of Amber Wilde's set where Evan Stanley talked about, hey, we have merch. We're going to be at the merch table. Uh, we'd like to meet you. I don't care if you don't buy shirts. Uh, and I remember thinking to myself, well, of course you don't care if people buy shirts. Because you're not a real band. You're just living out uh, some weird rock and roll fantasy camp uh, on your dad's coattails. Uh, you're not out there organically building your band. You're not out there living in shit vans, uh, praying to God that somebody buys a t-shirt so you have enough gas money to make it to the next show. Uh, or perhaps get something to eat. Uh, whether or not somebody buys one of your stupid shirts, you and your other Hollywood rich friends are going to climb on your daddy's private jet after the show and be whisked to the next town. So I don't know if I'm making myself clear on how I felt about Amber Wilde or my feelings uh, towards Evan Stanley. So I'll just put it bluntly in case I'm being too subtle. Dude, fuck off. Honestly, get the fuck out of here with your stupid band and your stupid little rich friends. Thank you. Anyway, after that, the band played for about a half hour. I was shocked when I realized it was only half hour. Because that was probably the longest half hour of my life. I felt as if somebody was taking a drill right here into my temple. Uh, after that... Uh, the band set up, the crew came out and set up for Kiss. The curtain dropped. I was very excited. And after a relatively quick set change, I had heard somebody said that they were having issues uh, with some of the stage mechanisms. I thought it went pretty quickly. Uh, I was really uh, excited. The crowd began to gather. Now, I don't believe uh, that the crowd was complete. I don't believe the show was completely sold out. But they drew a big crowd. I do remember seeing some empty seats here and there, but I thought uh, that the crowd was really good. The crowd was really into it, which I really liked. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what time it was, but the lights went down. Uh, the band came out, the explosions, the fireballs, the entire thing. And uh, even as somebody who comes from more of like a punk rock background, uh, once a Kiss show starts, you're just like sucked into it. You sort of can't help it. Uh, the band came out and started off. With Detroit Rock City, I absolutely love that song. Uh, within the first few notes of it, though, you could tell, uh, basically, as soon as Paul Stanley uh, started singing, uh, that the guy is really struggling with his voice. Now, I've heard some people say, oh, he can't sing at all anymore. I'm not going to say that. Uh, but he is struggling a little bit with his voice. Now, I am not going to come at Paul Stanley at all. I have all the respect in the world for him. I mean, the guy... He's 71 years old. He is not a young kid anymore. 
Uh, he's been doing this for 50 years with this band. Uh, the fact that his voice uh, is a little bit worn out, it's just there's nothing you can do about it. There's no, there's no way I'm going to sit here and pick on him. At one point in time, this guy was one of the greatest singers in the history of rock and roll. Uh, whether you're a fan or not, uh, you can't deny that. There's been a lot of debate among KISS fans that the, he sings with backing tracks, that he and Gene both sing with backing tracks. The band plays uh, to backing tracks. I don't know. I, I didn't really pick up on that. I mean, Paul's voice, uh, like I said, it was kind of rough. But I am going to give him nothing but love. Uh, he looks great. Uh, he moves around great. He plays great. And man, if I, when I'm 71 years old, I pray to God I'm in as, in as good a shape and have as much energy as he does. Uh, so yeah, his voice isn't what it once was, but you're talking about one of the guys, in my opinion, who was one of the greatest singers uh, in the history of rock and roll at one point in time, whether you're a fan or not. So his voice sounded a little bit rough, but I thought the band played Detroit Rock City great. Um, after that, they went into probably my favorite Kiss song of the night, at least the night that they played this night, and I shouted out loud. I realize that's probably a pretty generic uh, song if you're a Kiss fan, but it's one of my favorite Kiss songs of all time. Probably my second favorite Kiss song of all time. Uh, it always reminds me of the scene in Detroit Rock City, one of the greatest rock and roll movies ever made. Uh, it reminds me of that scene of the guys uh, driving down the freeway, listening to that song full blast, just singing their brains out. I love this movie. This is one of the greatest rock and roll movies ever made, by the way. I never get tired of it. Uh, but whenever I hear the song shouted out loud, it reminds me of that scene in that movie. Uh, I thought they played it great. Uh, again, apart from, well, really apart from Paul's voice struggling a little bit, again, nothing but love uh, to him. I'm not saying that to be dismissive at all. Uh, the band sounds great. I thought they played every song musically very well. After that, they played Deuce. Uh, Paul, uh, I would say that Gene Simmons, uh, his voice still sounds pretty good. Uh, much better than Paul's does. He obviously has a much different range on his voice. Uh, I thought that this song was played great. Uh, after that, they played War Machine. I love that song. Uh, I thought they played that song very well. Uh, just awesome. And again, uh, one thing about going to see Kiss that, you know, I know if you're a fan, you've seen them a bunch of times, you know, it's just the stage production was incredible. The light show was amazing. Of course, all the explosions and the fireballs. Even if you're the most hardened uh, anti-corporate rock person in the world, if you go to a KISS show and don't have fun, I think you're trying not to have fun. Uh, I loved War Machine. After that, they played... Uh, there are a few songs in the set list I was actually kind of surprised about, to be honest with you. Uh, the next one is one of them where they played Heavens on Fire. I really like that song a lot. Uh, I thought they killed it. Uh, again, it was one of those ones. Uh, there were three songs in the set list that kind of surprised me a little bit. And this was one of them. I don't know why. I hadn't been checking the set list, so I don't know why it surprised me. Uh, but it did. I thought it was awesome. Uh, after that... They played I Love It Loud, one of my favorite all-time Kiss songs. Uh, they destroyed the song. Uh, it's just a very contagious song. Uh, again, I don't know that uh, this is something that, you know, more diehard Kiss fans uh, would expect more than me. I was a little bit surprised they played this song. I don't know why. I know it's a big hit. I shouldn't maybe have been surprised. Uh, after that, they played Say Yeah. I love that song. I thought it was done very well. Man, uh, after that, they played the famous Cold Gin. Of course, Paul Stanley does the long uh, sort of uh, intro to the song. Actually, he had done, he did sort of a less of a kind of intro to this song than I've become accustomed to watching uh, live footage or listening to live records of the band. Uh, I like that song. It's not necessarily one of my favorite Kiss songs of all time. Uh, I do like it uh, after that. Tommy Thayer did his guitar solo, which uh, I think was probably pretty good. Uh, I'm the wrong person to ask when it comes to guitar solos. 
because I'm just not a fan of that. I've never been a fan of the doodly 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 guitar stuff. That's probably because I come from sort of a different musical fandom background. Um, it was probably pretty good. I just don't like it. One of my negative critiques of the show would be that there was too much just noodly guitar uh, mixed in everywhere. Uh, and I will say this, uh, whether you're a fan of Tommy Thayer and Eric Singer or not, now my favorite member of KISS is Ace Freely. Kind of always has been. I've just always loved the Spaceman. Uh, so I don't necessarily know how I feel about the sort of imitation uh, Ace and Peter but I will say that both Tommy Thayer and Eric Singer play great. Uh, they probably, I mean, I hate to say this, but they probably would be, they would probably play better than Ace and Peter would at this point in time. I thought the guitar solo uh, was good. I'm just not big into that. Uh, after that, they went into Lick It Up. Uh, that's always a fun song. Uh, yeah, <laughs> not... Not to, not necessarily lyrical gold, but I love the song "Lick It Up." It's always, uh, it's always a fun song to listen to. It's always a fun song to see live. Uh, after that, uh, they played "Calling Doctor Love." I really like that song a lot. I definitely like that song more than "Lick It Up." I would say it's probably in my top ten or so Kiss songs of all time. I really like that song. I thought they played it very well. Uh, after that, they played another song that kind of surprised me. I don't know why. I hadn't checked the set list uh, before this, uh, but the song was Making Love off of Rock and Roll Over. I really like that song. I was shocked, honestly, that they played that. Uh, not saying it's a deep cut or anything like that, but I thought it was really good. Uh, after that, they played a song that really surprised me, a song I didn't know at all, an album I don't know at all. Uh, they played the title track off Psycho Circus. I've probably heard the Psycho Circus album maybe once or twice. Uh, it's okay. I'm not a huge fan of it. Uh, and, you know, the live performance of the song was fine. I didn't know the song very well. I did think the stage uh, for that song was cool. The animation on the stage was cool. It's a song they could have left out. It's a song they could have traded something else in for, as far as I'm concerned. But uh, they didn't play it. Poorly, I thought it was kind of cool that they mixed in something a little bit newer, at least. Uh, after that, they went into the drum solo. Uh, of the solos, this was my favorite. Uh, Eric Singer was really good. It was a little bit long, obviously a little bit self-indulgent. I mean, that's the whole point. Uh, but I thought it was good. Uh, after that, they went into 100,000 Years. I really liked that song a lot. Uh, from that... Uh, they went into Gene's bass solo, which uh, was relatively brief, actually, uh, mercifully. Uh, and then from that, they went into God of Thunder. I love that song. This is the song where Gene is elevated up to the top of the stage uh, on the platform. And honestly, uh, he went up there pretty high. <laughs> I was, I, I'm, not a, I'm not the hugest fan of heights. And even watching him up there, I was... I felt like I was sort of worried about him a little bit. It was great. I love the song God of Thunder. Uh, it's one of my favorite Gene songs in the catalog. Uh, and he just destroyed it. Uh, again, Gene's voice sounds really good. Uh, still, again, he sings in a completely different range than Paul does. So maybe his voice is, you know, aged a little bit better. I mean, Gene's 74. He's not a young kid anymore either. Uh, he was moving around great. He looks like he's in good shape. He looked like he was having a good time, I'll say. All four members of the band uh, looked like they were genuinely having a good time. Uh, Paul Stanley mentioned at the beginning of the show uh, that this was their 24th show in Nashville, going back to the very early days. Uh, he kept mentioning it through the show. This was their last time coming to Nashville. Uh, it was very sad. There was sort of a uh, a sadness in the air whenever he talked about the end of the band and you know what goes on from here. Speaking of that band, Amber Wilde, I have heard uh, some Kiss fans uh, speculate that you know Evan Stanley is being groomed to replace Paul Stanley in some next incarnation of the band. I don't know if 
if that's actually a conspiracy or not. Uh, but it seems like something they would do. I don't know that KISS are necessarily a band that thrives on integrity. It's all about you know making money and being a business. That being said, like I said, I thought all four members of the band uh, looked like they were having a good time. They looked like they were uh, engaged. They actually had some sort of stage interaction I thought was cool. Uh, God of Thunder was great, and, and Gene does sound really good. Uh, after that, the famous part of the show where Paul Stanley flies across the stage. Now, this is where that low-hanging light ri lighting rig comes into effect. There was a B stage out in sort of the back end of the middle of the floor. Uh, of course, Paul flies out to it, which is cool. It's always uh, something that is fun to watch. Paul Stanley does this thing before he flies where he begs for your love and affection. A little bit too long, to be honest with you, but you basically have to invite him out there through your undying love, which, of course, all KISS fans have. I thought it was cool when he finally got over to the B stage and they went into Love Gun, which, man, I love that song. It's one of my favorite KISS songs of all time. That might be a top fiver for me. I absolutely love Love Gun. Uh, from that, he went into I Was Made for Loving You, uh, probably my wife's favorite Kiss song, sorry to say. Uh, and after that, they ended uh, the main part of the set with Black Diamond. For me, that's another easy top 10 uh, favorite Kiss song. I absolutely love uh, Black Diamond. Uh, for the encore, they came out and did a three song encore. Uh, three songs you would expect. No real surprises. They did Beth, uh, Do You Love Me, and Rock and Roll All Night. Awesome. Uh, my overall uh, critique of the show or my overall summary of the show is that it was really, really good. Uh, if you haven't seen Kiss in a while or you haven't seen this tour, uh, if you haven't seen it at all, I would take the opportunity if it comes anywhere near you. If we are to take what they say at face value, this is the end of the road. They are definitely one of the most iconic bands in the history of rock and roll. I think if you're a fan of this style of music, I mean, it's just one of those bands you sort of have to see uh, before it's too late. Uh, now, uh, I thought that the show was really good. I had a great time. Uh, before I get out of here real quick, I will show you uh, the shirt that I got. Just I just got one. My wife also got one. This is just the shirt that I got. The end of the road tour. Uh, I don't know if this is something uh, that I will necessarily wear or not. This could just be a museum piece. I thought the uh, actually the merch was really cool. They had a lot of really uh, cool shirts. I mean these guys are pros, uh, but I thought the show was really great. Uh, I would recommend if you go <laughs> and you don't want to see one of the worst bands you've ever seen in your entire life, maybe get there a little bit later. And I would say uh, to enjoy it, have a good time, just sort of temper your expectations a little bit. If you're going expecting to, to hear this, uh, you might be sorely, you might be a little bit disappointed. I mean, this how great is this album, by the way? One of the greatest live albums ever. I'm going to talk about this album at some point. And this is the goods right here. Uh, anyway, if you're, if you're going to the show expecting them to sound like, 1975 Kiss. You might be slightly disappointed, but I thought it was absolutely amazing. Uh, such a fun night. I say this uh, as a sort of a term of endearment, but these guys are pros. I mean, they know what they're doing. Uh, they go out there, they give their fans what they want, uh, and I think that they make their fans feel special. And if this really is the end of the road for Kiss, or at least of the Gene and Paul incarnation depending on uh, what the future holds as far as them possibly doing a kiss 2.0 uh, man it's it is sad it is sad that this is the end of this iconic brand obviously like i said gene and paul are both in their 70s you can't expect this thing to go on forever but they both performed very well uh, like i said paul's voice is a little bit worse for wear but man the guy is in incredible shape uh, he is Great interacting with the crowd. He plays 
guitar very well. He's very energetic. Man, I hope when I'm his age, I have that kind of energy. That would be best case scenario. Anyway, man, thank you so much for checking out this video. Uh, this is Archaic Records in Nashville, Tennessee. My name is Jamie. Uh, be sure to check back on this channel every week for Morrissey Monday, my weekly celebration of all things Morrissey and the Smiths. Uh, if you haven't and you have the opportunity, man, go out and check out the End of the Road Tour by Kiss. I don't think you'll be disappointed. I definitely was not. I had a great time. Uh, anyway, man, uh, thank you again so much for watching this video. Go out and support your local record store. Uh, be sure and check back on this channel uh, for more record content. And until next time, my friends, I will talk to you then.